Hey there, Jeff here. So I had an idea tonight for a thread, maybe a thread response that uh, maybe I'd like to trigger up and see. Something that came in this week made me kind of think about it. And I'm not even really sure how to word it because I don't want it to be uh, necessarily fully a negative. But here's the scenario. Let's say, show me an album. It could be CD, vinyl, whatever. Um, show me an album that you would consider to be, uh, see this is how to put it, subpar, not good, something that might be so somewhat just an embarrassment, and it could be mainly because horrible production, horrible, just the mix is bad, and you know, I'm not talking like demos per se, but just uh, an album. And usually it's going to be something that's maybe older or self-released. It just, it came out bad. It's just not a good album. I mean, it could be good songs. could be good, all that. But I'm just saying, you know, it's, it's just something about it that would not grant much favor to it. People would look at it and say, oh, that's horrible. That's, you know, that's just not good. But it means something to you. Something that you went out and purposely bought because it you liked it. For some reason, it appeals to you, even though you know, for the most part, other people kind of poo-pooed it. You know, not good, uh, an embarrassment, that's horrible, why would anybody do that? Now, I don't really want to say, I don't want to be too harsh with that, because the one that brought this to my attention is an album that I really liked, but I know is uh, subpar, not, not very good. Um, Bad production, you know, just the songwriting, you know, for the time, I guess, was pretty good. But, you know, it's just something that you probably wouldn't, that I probably wouldn't go out and say, hey, you got to check this band out. This is sort of like one of my own uh, feel-good finds that I wanted. Now, I have seen others in the VC. Well, except I think uh, Ron, Metal Ron, showed it the other day, which kind of, I think, is what made me think, oh, I need to go put it on my wish list. And I put it on my wish list at Discogs, and then it popped up for what I thought was a decent price, so I grabbed it because, again, it meant something to me. But it's not something that I would run around and, uh, you know, let all my friends listen to because it's just not that good in, in this, you know, something to show off. I stuck it on when I first got it last night. <laughs> I was playing it. My wife walked in the room, and she's like, what is that? Turn that horrible stuff off. I just kind of laughed. Exactly the response. That's just, that's hard to listen to. What is up with that? And then I mentioned, I said, well, well, I'll tell you. I, I mentioned, I said, that's the band that, and I told her one thing. And I said, it's also the band that inspired, and I gave her another thing. She goes, oh, are you talking about that band that you used to like? And then she mentioned that band. She, that was, she said, holy danger. I said, no, they're weird in a different way, but, uh, no, I said holy right. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So, as far as I know, this was a self-released, you know, well, it's, it's on a label, but it's, who knows, kind of a local California label, produced by the singer, which I just noticed, which is probably why, you know, when you self-produce albums, you tend to sometimes, unless you're really good at it, it can be kind of tough. The thing about this album is... The music is too soft, the guitars are too soft, and the vocals are too loud. The vocalist has a a voice that you either love or hate. On this album, I can't imagine people saying, I love those vocals. Kind of a deep, um, it's just, they're kind of, and they're, because they're loud, they're just, they, they don't come across good. Now, this was, this was in the mid-80s. Um, it's a Christian band. Mid-80s, a lot of Christian bands were coming out. And a lot of Christian bands wrote um, what you might consider like cheesy lyrics. You know, very, very in-your-face biblical, but to the point where they come off as a little... They're just not written very well, you know. And so, it, it, this is one of those very bold Christian albums. Satan's Lies, Living for Eternity, Satan, Leave That Boy Alone, uh, Holy Right, Lies of Men Tonight, Stop Killing the Children, had to have the abortion song. Um, 
Ben has a look for the 80s, anyway, but it's just it's just not well produced. It's not well mixed. It's not. It's pretty good for a, a self-released item, I think, which is kind of it. It's not on a major label. It might have been a local label, like I said. Anyway, this album got a lot of flack, at least amongst the friends that I knew. Maybe in California they were more popular. They played out and stuff, and they played with some big-name people. But this was always kind of a running joke with a lot of my friends. They're like, oh, that's a horrible album. Well, I liked it at the time. Anything that was Christian metal, you know, we, was, we were just scooping it up and absorbing it. And this was one of those. Even though it was kind of rough around the edges... For something, some reason it appealed to me so much to the point that I had made end up making contact with the singer um, back in the day. Used to talk to him all the time. Also, um, I joined the Holy Right mailing list fan club, and I received at least three of their newsletters back in the day before they broke up. And they're like little magazines. And here's something I just noticed tonight. Now I'm gonna have a hard time finding it because I should have earmarked it. Nope, right here. In this issue, and I don't even know what year it was, it's a three-year anniversary issue, so the band has been three years, it's September, October, and maybe you can't see it, but here's a list of other magazines, and we have White Throne, Take a Stand, Gospel Metal, I remember all these magazines. This one right here, God's Bangin', it says. That was a magazine called God's Bangin' Banner. They put out maybe, I want to say, maybe two issues. I remember having one of them. And then the band fold, the magazine folded. And I had just subscribed, so I was a little frustrated. I just paid money for like six issues for a yearly subscription. I got one issue, and then they folded. Um, I contacted the person who published the magazine. And it was just a photocopy magazine. Just fo it, was, it was really cheesy, cheap. I mean, you know, it was photocopied type uh, basic computer stuff. Anyway, so I contacted him and said, Hey, why don't you give me the mailing list and give me the magazine, and I'll... Re, you know, start sending something out to these people. I will honor how much they had subscribed. I will honor their issues in my magazine without making them subscribe. I don't know why I did it. I didn't have, you know, I, I didn't charge this guy to do it. I just wanted to start my own magazine. So I be, I took over God's Bang and Banner, but I changed the name to Pendragon. So I, it's funny that I saw that because I didn't even, you know, hadn't noticed that, that that was back in those days. Anyway, three newsletters that I still have from back in the day with the band. Now, the band um, didn't last much longer after that album, I believe. Um, I have a video of them playing, like a bootleg video of them playing it at the show, like Gazaris or something. Anyway, but like I said, I made contact with the singer. And we used to talk on the phone a lot. And because I started a magazine shortly thereafter, I heard that he did graphics. And so at some point, I might have asked him to do that. Anyway, so he, he ended up sending me, he made me a logo for my magazine, The Pin Dragon. So the singer actually designed that logo, and that's what appeared on my last three issues. So, whereas my first issue was, you know, I might have shown that in the past, just really cheesy. So I had him do that for me. Now the band shortly thereafter broke up, and the four members, and I, again, I don't know, I don't remember talking to him or finding out their, you know, what the grounds was, but. I don't know if they left him, if there was a problem. But anyway, the four members left, and they formed their own band called Iron Wrath. And uh, I need to angle this that way. I'm not sure what's either. Um, and they put out a four-song demo. They sounded pretty good, but you know they never really went anywhere. He started a new band called Final X, and um, it was him and Bill Minchin who. Uh, has done a lot of music since then. He's still around doing guitar type music. Anyway, they Final Act released basically one album. It was a cassette. Never was on vinyl, though I think this has been on vinyl overseas or something. But this is like my favorite. If I had to say, you know, listen to this guy sing, this is probably the one that, go check this out. Very much better production. Just better all around. Still love this album still one of my favorites um retroactive records put this out a handful of years ago 2005 wow well, 14 years ago and i was just thrilled because it's great they added a bonus track on here which never i'd never heard that had come out i guess after the band did it they never released a, a full album but they must have had recorded some songs 
Now, the other thing that was I was sad about this, because I wore this cassette out. I, I had this cassette and loved it. There was an opening track on here, which was just like, as if you were like riding through hell. It was like just a bunch of screams and stuff. But it, was, it sounded really well done. It was like really distant. It was kind of had some eerie music in the background, you know, and it was just eerie sound. You put some headphones on and you just listen. You could picture yourself like a roller coaster ride through a lake of fire. It was, it was interesting, but they took it off of that in order to add some other bonus tracks. Um, but then years later, 2000, I forget what year this was, 10 or something, they re-reissued the final acts and put that song back on it as well as another bonus track or two. The other thing about this one, and I'm not a real big fan of it in the sense because I was so, so used to this old one and I just don't like change. They had Robert Sweet of Striper come in and redo the drums. So the drums on here are different than on this release. I love this release. I don't know why, I can't remember why they did it. I don't know if this is just a drum machine. It kind of sounds sort of like a drum machine, but it's supposed to be a drummer. I love this, everything about this. His playing takes away from that on me. For me, it's different. But this is much better produced, remastered, redone with new drums. So this one, and you may find this one still out there, again, on Retroactive. And then later Retroactive, and then they released, uh, at, at some point, they released a second album by the band. And this I'd never heard before. And it's just as great. This is just great. Anyway, the vocals on here, while you can still tell it's the same singer, they're much, much, much better produced and so and much better mixed. And so overall, those releases sound a lot better. But Holy Right was a nostalgic uh, must-have for me that I really wanted to have again. Now, the final acts was back in the 80s. They disappeared off the scene for a while. Never heard much. And then somewhere in the 90s, I don't even know how I heard about this. It was on some label at the time, but I picked up this album by Titanic and didn't know much about them. I don't know, again, don't remember how I got them. Got them, listened to it, and I thought, wow, this stuff is really cool, really good stuff. I really enjoyed this. And, and for some reason, the vocals started kind of sounding, something was making me think, huh. But on this album, the singer went by a different name. But I looked and I looked at the pictures and I compared and I'm like, this, there's, the vocals have to be Keith Miles from that band. And yeah, sure enough, it is. I'm, he changed his name. I'm not sure exactly why. This is a great album. It was also reissued and remastered and Robert Sweet <laughs> played drums on this. Robert Sweet and Bill, the guitar player, uh, I believe they all live in Vegas together and they do a lot of stuff together. So at this point, Robert was doing a lot of stuff with them. Um, and this was really kind of around the time, right before Striper went off, you know, became, got back together and started going full force again. Titanic released a second album. Maybe not quite as good, but still, I love this album. The first album and the first Final X album, still favorites. This has got a lot of good stuff on it and they did the same thing, remastered that with Robert Sweet on drums. And, uh, change things up a little bit then there was one other album that the singer did again with the same with bill the same guitar player uh under the, under the band name subdue some of the songs were songs that had been done before with titanic but slightly changed and um i have a digital copy of that i don't know if it was ever released if it was i'd like to get a physical copy i think it was on cd um and i believe the singer was also somewhere in where was he at in arizona phoenix or something and bill was in nevada in Vegas area. Anyway, he's not singing anymore. He's not doing anything from what I understand musically. Sad, you know, I, I still enjoyed him. And um, that was, uh, so that's the history of that. So, thread response, get me a uh, album or as many as you wish that you feel it's probably something that you wouldn't share with your friends because it's kind of, you know, subpar, embarrassing. Something's wrong that uh, you don't think the common people <laughs> would like it, but it's something that you really like. It might have come with the, uh, you know, like I say, it may have been not well received at the time, maybe, uh, and for some reason it just struck a nerve with you and you really enjoyed it. Now also, real quick, I did. I, I was in here before, totally failed to mention, and then last time I went back into my other place and it's all destroyed and I failed to mention anything about it, but new surroundings, months ago, or a couple months ago in a video, I talked about how I was seeking to move my stuff into a front room to make more of an office here. Well, that has kind of begun. So now I have my vinyl, I split them up on two shelves and was able to get them all here. I got a bunch of CDs below me. I got uh, another 
bunch of CDs coming in. I got the CDs from back in the back room over here on my sides now. I'm gonna get another bookshelf on that wall that you won't be able to see where more CDs are gonna go and um, have all my CDs in from my back shed that I had spotlighted that one time in the video. Um, and around me I've got a bunch of books and stuff. I'm not gonna show you now because the camera's precariously on this wobbly table. Because I don't have a desk in here yet. We're kind of getting stuff into this room. The lighting in here is horrible for videos. I am uh, working on getting something in here that's gonna make it uh, better for that. Um, an overhead light of some sort. Anyway, so this is going to be the new room and uh, this will hopefully be around the new backdrop. So anyway, thanks for watching. And uh, you know, like I say, if you could feel to respond, uh, please do. And uh, let's see what you got that uh, might be embarrassing, but that you really enjoy. Thanks a lot and rock on. Oh,